Well, good morning. Welcome to Incarnation. My name is Amy, and I'm a pastor here. Uh, just a few words before we begin. We have restrooms available back in this corner of the gym or down the hall. Um, also, just worth noting, the kids worship with us here in the service, so they tend to spend time back in this corner, um, but we see them moving all around. And just like the kids move wherever they would like to, to worship best, the grown-ups are also invited to do that. So if you find this back corner perhaps a little bit loud, or maybe a little bit of wiggles that you find distracting, you're welcome to move closer to the front where it tends to be a little calmer. Now let's just take a moment to take a deep breath, to be quiet before we begin our worship together. I invite you to stand. Blessed be God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Let's pray together for our hearts. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you, and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear what our Lord Jesus Christ says. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Let's sing.
be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and merciful God, it is only by your grace that your faithful people offer you true and lawful service. Grant that we may run without stumbling to obtain your heavenly promises through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And now is the time in our service where we pray for the kids of this church. So if there is a kid near you, I invite you to extend a hand toward them or toward a kid on a Zoom screen near you. But let's pray for the kids of this church. Thank you, Father, for these children. Thank you for their presence with us, for the things that they teach us, how to wonder and delight in you. We pray that they would know you as, your, as their good shepherd, that you would lead and guide and bless them all the days of their lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Any kids want to come up here and help us lead their kids' song? Feel free to walk away on the Eva Astronomers. <laughs> Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verses 1 through 6 and 9 through 11. I said to myself, come now, I will make a test of pleasure. Enjoy yourself. But again, this also was vanity. I said of laughter, it is mad, and of pleasure, what use is it? I searched with my mind how to cheer my body with wine. My mind still guided me with wisdom and how to lay hold on folly until I might see what is good for mortals to do under the heaven during the few days of their life. I made great works. I built houses and planted vineyards for myself. I made myself gardens and parks and planted in them all kinds of fruit trees. I made myself pools from which to water the forest of growing trees. So I became great and surpassed all who were before me in Jerusalem. Also my wisdom remained with me. Whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I kept from my heart no pleasure, for my heart found pleasure from all my toil. And this was my reward from all my toil. Then I considered it all that my, then I considered all that my hands had done and the toil I had spent in doing it, and again, all was vanity, and chasing after wind, and there was nothing to be gained under the sun. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please join us in praying Psalm 49, verses 1 to 18. Hear this, all you peoples, ponder it with your ears, all who dwell in the world. I love rich and poor, everyone with his neighbor. My mouth shall speak of wisdom, and my heart shall muse on understanding. I will incline my ears to a parable, and declare my dark sayings with the heart. Why should I fear in the days of wickedness, and when the wicked at my heels encompass me round about? There are some who put their trust in their goods, and in boast in the multitude of their riches. But no one can deliver his brother, nor pay unto God a price for him. 
that they should live forever and should not see the grave. For we see the wise men die, as well as the ignorant and foolish. They perish alike and be their wishes for others. And yet they think that their houses shall continue forever, and that their dwelling places shall endure from one generation to another, and they call lands after their own names. Man is like an ox that has no understanding. A reading from Colossians chapter 3, verses 5 to 14. Put to death, therefore, whatever in you is earthly, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming on those who are disobedient. These are the ways you also once followed when you were living that life. And now you must get rid of all such things. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive language from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have stripped off the old self with its practices and have clothed yourself with the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge according to the image of its creator. In that renewal, there is no longer Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, Barbarian, Scythian, enslaved, and free. For Christ is all and in all. Therefore, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bear with one another, and if anyone has a, has a complaint against another, forgive each other. Just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. Above all, clothe yourselves with love binds everything together in perfect harmony. The word of the Lord. Peacemakers that work in some of the most difficult conflicts, both at 
home and abroad. And I, all the way back then, asked if he ever preached, and he very courageously said, maybe, sure, sometimes. <laughs> so I'm delighted that he's here, and let me just pray for you, David. Um, we're really glad you're with us. Father, thank you for David. Thank you for the work that he does. Thank you for the work of Elos. Thank you for the work of peace building. God, would you make us peace builders? And would you bless David through the work that he brings this morning? In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning, incarnation. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with you this morning. Um, I was delighted when Amy asked me to guest preach here as I'm actually a member of Restoration Wellington, which I know many of you once attended and which attended this church. Um, so it's a pleasure to be here with you this morning. As Amy mentioned, my name is David Cadwell. I live here in DC in the Columbia Heights neighborhood, uh, and I'm the Director of Communications and Christian Engagement at Telos, which is an organization which forms communities of peacemakers across lines of difference to help heal seemingly intractable conflict at home and abroad. And traditionally, most of our work has uh, work been in Israel, Palestine, and the conflict that's happening there in transforming America's engagement with that part of the world. But we've also started in the past couple years doing a lot of work looking at our own conflicts here in the US. Uh, and that's a little bit about what I will be speaking about today. Uh, and at Telos, I get specifically to do work with Christian communities to help us learn how to heed Christ's call to be peacemakers to see and incarnate the hope of shalom woven throughout the Bible into this very world. As Amy mentioned, we met a few months ago in Matthew 25, um, a gathering for Anglicans invested in work of justice and ministry, where we discussed what it means to build bridges across divides in the work of restoration and of peacemaking and of kingdom building in this now but not yet age. The themes we discussed that week came directly into view as Amy and I joined a group of about 20 others from the conference in an excursion across the U.S. border into Ciudad Juarez in Mexico, where thousands of migrants from Central America have congregated over the years in order to cross into the U.S. We went on this excursion to better understand the realities of immigration facing our nation and what it will take to build a future where all people, those deemed American and those dreaming to be American, can flourish. During our trip, we visited a shelter housed at a renovated church, which provides safe haven for vulnerable migrants on their journey to the US. Many of these migrants have fled violence, chaos, and a future robbed of the dignity of hope. They traversed hundreds of miles across dangerous passages to land right where we stood, awaiting the opportunity to receive asylum in the land of promise. But many of them had waited months or even longer in that shelter, dreaming of a life no longer in constant risk, but having their hope dwindle like the fainting light at the end of a candle. As we sat with some of these migrants, we laughed and broke bread together and celebrated a special evening of graduation for many of the women. And I was truly struck at the power of the moment. The Mexican church had stood in the gap in a moment of crisis to provide for the needs of those around it, transforming itself truly in a, in a mere 24 hours to be a home for dozens of migrants caught by the dangerous snare of exile, all while giving them tangible skills to help them flourish on their side. To me, we were sitting in the very embodiment of a neighbor love powerful enough to transform lives. And it was really quite beautiful. And yet something about that moment also felt disturbed to me. My group and I had just come for just a few hours, and we were all about to leave, to cross the border bridge with barely a moment's delay. And when we did, there was no interrogation, no patting down, no dog searches, not even a scolding at a forgotten passport. We passed our way across that bridge and back into our lives of abundance. Abundant security, abundant provisions, abundant power, and abundant freedom to come and go as we pleased. While those women had to stay behind, their future in the balance. I looked back across that bridge and saw not only the growing distance separating us geographically, but also the distance between our opportunities and the world. 
I realized that this gap between access and freedom and flourishing I experienced on my side and the insecurity and lack and vulnerability experienced on theirs was completely man-made. It is the result of a breaking of shalom and my previous failure to love its neighbor in its quest for more. What I saw in that moment was a failure of God's people to be peacemakers in this world. You see, peacemaking isn't just about not taking sides and avoiding conflict. It's neither fence sitting nor kumbaya diplomacy. It's the active quest of choosing a side, of fighting for justice in a way that preserves the dignity of all and opens opportunity for reconciliation. In Christianity, we would call it the reweaving of shalom. Shalom, which means so much more than just peace in Hebrew, but the ordering of all things in which all people live in right relationship with God, with each other, and with creation in societies of flourishing and justice and peace. A world of shalom is a world with our neighbors. Those across the street from us, those worshiping in temples or mosques or no place at all, and definitely those across the borders that we hold so dear to our identity. To actually build this world of shalom, we have to hold at our core this most basic commitment of neighbor love. This neighbor love says that my neighbor deserves the very same things that I do. It means, in fact, that our lives and our futures are bound together. It means that for all of us to flourish, I have to know when to say enough. Enough food in the pantry. Enough funding for my kid's school. Enough security at our borders. None of these things are bad in and of themselves, and we are right to seek them. God is blessed in our joy and our protection. But we must learn to see with Jesus' eyes how our grasping for them affects our neighbors. And we must, as the people of God, learn there comes a time when love demands us to say, no more, now this is yours. As the people of God, how quickly are we able to say, enough? Like in the moment Amy and I experience on the border, I see far too often a furious grasping for protection, provision, and belonging at the expense of our neighbors. Even in just the past few years, we've seen wealth disparities grow wider and wider as Christians in the U.S. give less and less. We've seen dangerous ideological movements arise, often driven by the church, which draw narrow boundaries between what it means to be one of us, what it means to be a dangerous outsider. We've seen vulnerable people across the world press in for rest, for a breath, while we build walls and barriers in their way. And we've seen Christians spearhead the movement to erase our fraught history in the name of protecting our kids from negative emotions, rather than teaching them to name sin and repent and pursue healing in God's name. But God's word calls us to more. It calls us to neighbor love. And neighbor love demands that we ask, how can I enjoy for myself what I would deny my neighbor? How can I enjoy abundant prosperity for my family while condemning my neighbor to languish in a migrant shelter on the border? How can I enjoy abundant security for my community while I turn a blind eye to the criminalizing of my neighbors? If we are really to love our neighbor, and by so doing become peacemakers and join with God in the reweaving of shalom, we must know when to say enough. Jesus' words in Luke 12 invite us into this radical act of neighbor love, which is bearing witness to a kingdom not built on the fear and ambition and insecurity of the world, but on the abundance, provision, and presence of God. In this passage in Luke, Jesus has just been speaking to a crowd about bearing witness to the kingdom of God, even when it costs us persecution. And he is interrupted by a question. Teacher, tell my brother to split his inheritance with me. Now, it was an odd question to ask. It was a question that offended social customs of the day that the eldest received the inheritance and all the privileges included of higher social standing. 
is he'll publicly broach a taboo idea in this culture revealed something significant about the asker. A deep anxiety around possessions and status, about being without, and it led him to so much ambition and greed that he was willing to publicly embarrass himself for it. Now Jesus flips the question back at him. Who made me a judge and arbitrator over you? And while there's a note of correction, I hear more in Jesus' words the question, who gave me the authority you believe that I have? As in, what kind of kingdom do you believe that I am ushering in? One that is concerned with social standing and wealth, ever-present anxiety of fearing being without, or an abundant in the riches that come with trust in God. Abundant in neighbor love and abundant in shalom. Jesus then offers a warning to the crowd and to his disciples. Watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed for one's life, one's protection, one's meaning, one's soul is not found in the abundance of things. Jesus is warning us. Without care, we'll turn to the safety and the things that we need and make them ultimate. We'll forget about our neighbor as we feel that there isn't enough for all of us. And out of that fear, we'll believe we can never have enough of what we need. And in order for us to get it, we have to take it from our neighbor. In my work studying conflict, I've come to learn this belief is at the core of all violence and oppression and conflict. Jesus knows this, which is why he shares a story to the crowd in response to his warning. Here is what anxiety around possessions, what not saying enough, will do to you. He tells us of a man of extreme wealth who's blessed with an abundant crop, a gift from God. The man thinks to himself, what should I do? I have no place to store my crops. So the man makes the decision to build new storage facilities in order to sell the crop at a later date for a greater price, when supply isn't so abundant. To our ears, this is a shrewd economic decision. It's playing the game of the market, right? But this act would have been seen as, quote, odd in the extreme to listeners, according to one commentator. Why? Because it showed his lack of awareness or concern for the interconnection of his community, the reality that his decisions affect his neighbors. He never considered selling the crops in the year of abundance, decision that would have lowered prices for the community and benefited everyone, especially the most vulnerable. What appeared to be a shrewd business decision, one that in our culture would have been respected and probably even celebrated, actually comes at the expense of his neighbor's ability to flourish. Notice how the man never consulted, talked to, or thought about another individual through the whole ordeal. His decision wasn't one of smartness. It was one of self-concern only. He failed to love his neighbor. Ultimately, we see that the rich man was not satisfied with enough. He found security in amassing as much as he could. And in this culture, these possessions offered him all the power, comfort, and security that we so desperately fight for in ours through our working, our war-making, and our wall building. God reveals the folly of such a life, asking of the man, once you die, will all these things which you withheld from others still be yours? What can these things you withheld do for you once you are no longer alive? I think Jesus is asking us two things in this parable. One, who is on the other side of your striving for more? And two, what if the antidote to our fears and insecurities is not collecting as much as possible, but being rich toward God? He's asking, what if our security came not from abundant possession, but from from abundant presence? What if the richness and abundance we long for is only provided by the assuredness of our own standing with God? What if it's only provided in the truth that God sees us as God's beloved? In your life, do you really believe that you are God's beloved? I remember the first time that I 
really, truly believe this, and the truth actually hit me. I uh, spent a year after my undergrad degree at UNC um, overseas on missions, and one night I was sitting alone in my apartment on the 17th floor, looking at the stars and the skyscrapers off our balcony. And I was reading this book, The Road Back to You, by Ian Cron, about the Enneagram, all the rage in today's Christian communities. And in the introduction, Franciscan priest, Father Richard Ward, prayed a prayer over the author that through this study, he would come to see himself with the same pride, delight, and expectation that God sees him with. To be honest, my immediate reaction to reading that was honestly to scoff. We're all too sinful for God to see us with pride and delight and expectation. God wants us to be righteous. And then it hit me. What if that is really how God sees me? What if that really is the gospel? That in spite of my unrighteousness, the God who made all things, who made the vastest of space and the tiniest of atoms, sees me and beams with pride, shakes with delight, and smiles in expectation that all that I will be revealed to be one day. What if God's love for me was really that deep? And how quickly did I reveal how little I believed it? I sat in my apartment that night and I wept in grief and in joy, almost a, a silent baptism, shaking off all of the fear and the striving for more, and embracing the abundance of presence my Creator was furiously waiting for me to taste. Who's on the other side if you're striving for more? Where do you see fear saying enough? Do you really believe God's love for you and his abundant supervision is really that deep? Whether we have much or little in this world, when we believe that as Romans 8 says, nothing in all of creation can separate us from the love of God, our strivings cease. We begin not to be, to be ruled by the, our fear of being without and come to be able to say enough, generously offering what we have for the sake of our neighbors. This is what it means to be a witness to God's kingdom, a shalom bringer, and a peacemaker. Mother Teresa famously said, if we have no peace, it is because we have forgotten that we belong to each other. There's one woman who embodies this concept better than anybody I know. Her name is Roni Kedar. She lives in a place of extreme insecurity on the border between Israel and the Gaza Strip, which is a Palestinian territory. Dotting the neighborhoods that she lives around are bomb shelters, which residents must flee to within 10 seconds of alarms going off at any and all times of day unexpectedly if rockets are launched from Gaza into the area. Yet Roni doesn't despise her neighbors. She sees them as equal human beings, as deserving of the same right to a dignified life that she has. And she chooses to fight for their security, their dignity, and freedom, knowing that the 15-year Israeli blockade just blocked Gaza off from the rest of the world and created the world's largest open-air prison uninhabitable, according to the UN, only makes Palestinians more vulnerable. And because of that, doesn't make her safe for all. So she advocates with her neighbors for an end to the bombings of Gaza that leave homes and offices destroyed, and dozens of innocent men, women, and children homeless or worse. She advocates for an end to the blockade and freedom of movement for Palestinians, so they can receive life-saving hospital treatment across the border in Israel or visit their families in the West Bank. And she is often ridiculed, being told that she'd, she'd be putting her savings, herself in danger with these policies. Garoni knows that the abundance of security these policies grasp for don't actually keep her secure in the long run. She knows that an overabundance of security for her means oppression and vulnerability for another. And if she is to flourish, 
she knows her neighbors must flourish too. So she says, our security is enough. Now it is time to love our neighbors. Incarnation, where are you grasping for more? Where do you not believe your own belovedness by God and strive for abundance, abundant power, abundant comforts, abundant freedom? Who is on the other side of your striving? How can you say enough and begin offering to your neighbor what you know they need and so as peacemakers bring the kingdom of God? Our Lord said in the famous Sermon on the Mount, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Let's pray. God of mercies, steady our hearts as we confront our fears. As we shine your light in the hard to reach places of our hearts that hide our idols, that hide the things we believe we cannot live without. Root out our fears and replace them with your love. Fill our absence with your presence and give us the strength and wisdom to know when to say enough. We thank you that your love is free, and sure, and forever. And we ask for your help to show us this love to all our neighbors, even when it hurts. God of all, we thank you that none of this generosity is ever in vain, but is the seed of your coming and perfect kingdom, which we pray comes soon. Amen.
Let us confess together our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is visible and invisible. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. I invite you to be seated as we pray together. If you would please, when I say in your mercy, if you would respond by saying, hear our prayer. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. Dear Lord, thank you for summertime, for the songs of cicadas and birds. Thank you for gardens that flourish with abundance of vegetables and flowers. Thank you for rainbow clouds that linger and remind us of your promises. Lord, please help us to see your loving hand in creation. Help us to pause and give thanks for everyday blessings and for extraordinary blessings. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, thank you for David, our guest this morning for the TELUS group and their labor for peace. We ask that you will give them successful transitions in their organization as longtime members move on to new adventures and new hires join the team. We ask for clarity of purpose and honesty of witness that they will hold the vision of shalom and mutual flourishing as their Northern star. We ask that you will help them persevere in moments that wear down the soul when conflict becomes more than they can hold and resistance from communities tempts them to believe that they are on their own. We ask that as David enters a new role as director of communications and Christian engagement, that you will cause him to blossom and to flourish and that you will give him wisdom, insight, and creativity in his new role this fall. Lord, we thank you for the beautiful country of Nicaragua, our country this week. Our hearts break for families separated by political unrest there. We ache for those who must flee for the sake of preserving their lives, for new countries to call home. Guide them on their journey, protect, shelter, and lead them to a welcoming refuge, to a new place. Lord, I pray that you would bring peace to Nicaragua. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, please bring peace to Ukraine. 
Please sustain and protect Marguerite and her fellow Young Life counselors as they hold camps in Ukraine for young people in the midst of war. Please be with Nastya and grow her faith and protect her home. Please protect Aiden and his mom and dad. Lord, please tend to and protect all the children of Ukraine and all the children all over the world who are affected by hunger and by loss in this war. Lord, in your mercy, Lord, please be with the people of Kentucky, those devastated by floodwaters. In your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we thank you for the bishop um, candidates that you've given to us. We pray that you would be with these men and that you would lead us to select a man of your choosing to be our next bishop. We also ask that you please continue to lead and bless John, Bishop John Guernsey and Bishop Archbishop Foley Beach. We, Lord, ask for your blessing on Amy and Josie and David and Emily. Please bring forward our assistant pastor, Lord. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, please guide our national leaders. Please lead and guide those who um, govern our commonwealth and those who govern our county. May they make good and right decisions. Lord, in your mercy. And Lord, we ask that you please watch over Randolph Elementary School and this community. Lord, please tend to our hearts and minds and draw us closer to you each day that we may worship you and lift up your holy name. Lord, in your mercy. And now let us humbly confess our sins to Almighty God. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in his great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins to all those who sincerely repent and with true faith turn to him, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the word of God to all who truly turn to him. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I invite you to stand. The peace of the Lord be always with you. I invite you to take a few minutes to greet those around you with a word of peace. I just wanted to ask, um, so I'm not babysitting me, so I can do Well, a warm good morning to those of you that are here in person and those of you that are with us on Zoom. I'm so glad the internet is cooperating with our Zoom this morning. Um, 
that's always a very good thing. We prayed about that before the service, so excellent. Jesus. Um, I just have a couple of announcements about things happening here at Incarnation, and it's summer, so it's not a lot of things right now. But first of all, just a warm welcome to those who are visiting with us. Um, we have out in the narthex-ish area of the school here, um, a few things which you are welcome to take. We have these little blue cards that you can fill out just to give us your name, your contact information, that way we know how to reach you. Um, we also have Books of Common Prayer, which is where our liturgy comes from, and um, NRSV Bibles, which is the translation of the Bible we use here, which you are welcome to take with you. Um, so please partake of that goodness. Um, and speaking of goodness, next Sunday is a donut Sunday, so everyone is invited to bring donuts, breakfasty things, juice, whatever you want, um, and we'll linger after the service and have a sort of late donut breakfast together. So um, please plan to bring something, please plan to stay. We would love to celebrate donuts together. Also coming up, uh, we keep announcing this because I want you to remember it, but the fall retreat is going to be that last weekend of September and we'll be out at Camp High Road. Uh, there is space to camp and also space to stay indoors so you can kind of choose your own adventure there. Um, but it will be just a really refreshing time away Lots of beautiful outdoor spaces, lots of spacious indoor spaces, and I'm really looking forward to it. So we'll open up registration next month, just as soon as Emily gets back from vacation, and um, we'll send you the link, and we hope you guys will sign up. Uh, and that's actually all we've got right now. <laughs> so I'm loving the exuberance back at the back this morning. Um, but in a few minutes, we will turn toward the table, and so just so that you know this table is open to everyone who is baptized and following Jesus. This does not need to be the church where you normally worship. You do not need to be Anglican to come to the table. Um, the ushers will invite you forward. You can come with your hands open and the servers will take a piece of bread, dip it into the wine and place it in your hand and then you can consume it. Uh, we'll have gluten-free bread and wine available over here. You can just ask your server for that. And if for any reason you don't want to receive communion, we would love for you to come forward anyway. You can just cross your arms over your chest, that way we know not to put bread in your hand, and we'll pray a quick prayer of blessing for you. But now let us turn toward the table and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us.
is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. All things come from you, O Lord. And by your own have we given you. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is right, our duty and our joy, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, for he is your living word from before time and for all ages. And by him you created all things, and by him you make all things new. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. <coughs> holy, 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 Lord God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Be seated. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love, you made us for yourself. And when we had sinned against you and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent your only Son, Jesus Christ, into the world for our salvation. By the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, he became flesh and dwelt among us. In obedience to your will, he stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself once for all, that by his suffering and death we might be saved. By his resurrection, he broke the bonds of death, trampling hell and Satan under his feet. As our great high priest, he ascended to your right hand in glory, that we might come with confidence before the throne of grace. On the night that he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, Jesus took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Therefore we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ, Christ has died, Christ, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, and we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your word and Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Sanctify us also, that we, we might worthily receive this holy sacrament and be made one body with him, that he may dwell in us and we in him. And in the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ and bring us with all your saints into the joy of your heavenly kingdom where we shall see our Lord face to face. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia! Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia! We do not presume to come to this your table, O merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your abundant and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord whose character is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, 
so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body, and our souls washed through his most precious blood, and that we may evermore dwell in him and he in us. Amen. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Grant us your peace. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. I invite the servers to come.
Heavenly Father, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. There we go. And now the cross is over here, for those of you who can't see it, but let's send our problems to it. All our problems we send to the cross of Christ. All our difficulties, we, we send, send to the cross of Christ. All the devil's works, we, we send, send to the cross of Christ. And all our hopes, we, we set on the risen Christ. And now the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, be among you and remain with you always. Amen. And now let us go forth into the world rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Thanks be to God. Alleluia. Alleluia. We will have prayer available uh, in this corner for anyone who would like it. There will be a prayer team there after the service. It's a beautiful day. If anyone would like to ride on the zip line or play outside, <laughs> uh, I would encourage you just to linger and meet someone you haven't met. Thanks a lot. Have a great week. Thank <laughs> you.